Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, May 10th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee. Uh, we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Molly Burnham? Present. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. 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 Excellent. So the first item on our agenda is the public comment period. Um, and I would ask people to please, um, when they approach the podium, to just state your name and address for the record. Um, and then I would also ask you to please limit your comments um, to three minutes. I'll kind of keep a timer here. Um, I have a sign up sheet. And the first person who signed up to speak this evening um, is David Marlin. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, first of all, for all that you do. I know how hard you guys all work. I, I know many of you, and I know that it's an all-consuming job. I, I'm grateful for your effort. And I also just want to take this opportunity to thank the, just to say how grateful I am to the whole Northampton public school system. My kids are both products from kindergarten of Jackson Street, which is a super special place with a super special principal and the greatest ever first grade teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and also to NHS, where I have another uh, student, which is uh, just an amazing place. It's got such a great vibe with great principal, great teachers. Um, I'm here because I'm passionate about an area that I really feel needs to be addressed, which is math in our schools. Um, my son really wants to be an aeronautical engineer. He loves math, but the current curriculum is quite simply holding kids back. Uh, private school kids have an unfair advantage when it comes to the levels that they get to uh, start in math, um, opportunities that aren't afforded to the public school kids. Uh, our kids are not able to progress as fast as at other schools, and it just simply is not fair. And before I go any further, I just want to say we've been had this discussion before. A lot of people have criticized people like myself as being elitist, and I just want to say please stop that. It's hurtful, it's name-calling, it's hateful, and it's prejudice. Let's, let's please have a civil discussion about this on the merits and not be calling people elitist. Again, it, I find that extremely hurtful and I, I really hope it doesn't come to that this time around. So my ask is when the current math curriculum was introduced five years ago, we were promised a reevaluation after five years. And I would really appreciate having the curriculum committee look at the successes and the issues objectively, look at the data, consider the options, involve the community. I am not against integrated math per se. Um, I do think there needs to be some tweaks. My hope is that we can build on what was started five years ago. It may just take a few tweaks. Um, I know that Northampton can be great when it comes to math. Um, it's got great teachers. It's got uh, great, amazing kids and atmosphere. Um, and, and, and I know a lot of these kids are really passionate about STEM, and let's give them the opportunity to accelerate to the point that they can. Let's bring the charter school kids back. I know so many parents who left our school system to go to charter schools, to go to public schools because of math, and it's time to address it. Let's show everybody how HAMP is building on our learnings and becoming the greatest math, math uh, school system in, in the valley, in Western Mass. Um, and again, I think all it's going to take is just a few tweaks. And, and all I'm asking right now is that the curriculum committee get together, address this issue. Again, look at the facts objectively, and let's figure out what we can do to improve the current math curriculum. That's all I'm doing. Let's just look at the data. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at the student survey that's coming out. And let's see what tweaks we can make. I'm not saying throw it out. I'm saying let's build on what we've got. Let's see objectively what the data shows, what other schools in the area are doing, because our kids are not able to progress in math as fast as other school systems. And it's extremely frustrating to parents whose kids are good at math and really want to progress at math. So that, that is my ask to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Okay. The next speaker who has signed up is the aforementioned amazing principal, Gwen Agna. <laughs> okay. Um, I have Marissa, I have Scott, I have Clarissa. 
So we know that we have at least one more reading for the naming of the greenhouse for Ms. Mary Bates, who is our first grade teacher who's retiring. And I wanted to speak on behalf of a parent about that, and then others would like to speak about it too. First, this is from Jordan Abbott. We have tried to help with the garden anytime we've had the opportunity since our first child started at Jackson Street in 2012. Mary Bates has been a visionary and energetic leader on every occasion, whether the tasks involved weeding and mulching and general cleanup and preparation, building or repairing structures, or raising money to keep the garden program strong. We joined the greenhouse construction team late in the process. Countless hours, days, weekends had already been put into preparing the site, building the retaining wall, and constructing the frame. Mary was anxious to get the sides and roof in place before winter, which was imminent. It was Sunday of the last scheduled weekend and the sky was gray, scattered rain was falling, and worst of all, the wind was blowing hard. Mary's determination and commitment were infectious and the team was forging ahead. We started to move the 12 foot sheets of plastic from storage to the greenhouse site. As Mary and I turned the corner with one of them, a gust caught it like a sail and I thought Mary and I were both going to be swept away, <laughs> along with her dreams of an enclosed greenhouse before winter. It did take more than parent volunteers to get the greenhouse finished, but it happened before winter, just as Mary hoped it would. The Jackson Street Garden, like the other school gardens, is a place where dreams are planted and nurtured through shared work, and the harvest is rich. In her great wisdom as a teacher, Mary knows that learning happens inside the classroom and out, and she has dedicated herself to providing outstanding learning environments for her first graders and all the students at Jackson Street. What a fitting tribute to name the greenhouse an inside-outside space for growth and learning after Mary Bates. Thank you. Hi, I'm Liz Horn. Um, I'm, my family's so grateful that both our children had Ms. Bates as an amazing first grade teacher. And I could go on and on about what an extraordinary teacher she is and how much she's given to her students. But she gave to the greater school community with all her work for the garden and the greenhouse. She really championed the idea of an outdoor classroom and that the greenhouse would allow that to be all through the year. And she's hands-on in the garden. She wrote grants, she gave tours, and she really connected how the garden was part of all of the curriculum. Um, and I just think it would be such a wonderful tribute and so fitting, and I love the idea that in years to come, students who don't know Mary Bates will just think it's the most natural thing in the world that there is an outdoor classroom that learning continues all year round outside. And we love you and we're grateful to you and congratulations on your retirement. Hello, my name is Marissa Hochstetter. I have two first graders um, at Jackson Street and one is in Ms. Bates's class. I'm very fortunate. Um, I'm also a member of the development committee of the Northampton Education Foundation, which as I'm sure you know is partially um, supported the project and so um, I've been able to see the project from many different angles um, to participate in one of the volunteer days and um, just seeing someone so dedicated to a project um, outside of regular school hours but then also how it's been integrated into the classroom and the school um, when my daughters were kindergartners they were able to participate and now as first graders um, so I just want to enthusiastically support the proposal and, um, and thank Ms. Bates for her dedication. Um, I feel so lucky that we were able to get in this last year with her. Um, it's been really um, a fabulous uh, first grade year for my daughters. Thank you. Hi, my name is Quinn. I had. Miss Bates as a first grade teacher and she was really wonderful. It was the best year of my life and the, she was really enthusiastic in guardi gardening and stuff and she loved to be outside and do stuff in the garden. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> yes, and we think it would be a wonderful, wonderful fitting thing to name it for Miss Bates. Thank you. My name's Scott Biddle. I've known Mary Bates for eight years since my daughter uh, was with her. And she has always trumpeted the benefits of garden education. I've been with her in the classroom, out in the 
uh, out in the garden itself on work days uh, and at the um, the school plant sale, and she is just very, very passionate about the garden, and uh, most re recently, most passionate about this greenhouse. She came to the PTO, <laughs> PTO uh, committee meetings uh, to start it off and try to get the support for it, and then um, she rallied us all together to get out there and put the frame up, and then on this very, very windy day, uh, she was there when the panels were being blown off, and uh, and this was right at the edge of uh, December, and she really wanted to get it done by um, by before the winter came, and she knew how to find the people and get the resources to finish that off and get it done. And uh, just recently, we did more work in there, and uh, she's loaded up the boxes in there with all the dirt and uh, gotten it ready for all the plants to come along. So um, this truly would be a great fitting tribute to have her name uh, attached to the greenhouse. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for letting us all say this. And I just want to thank Mary Bates for all that she's put into and done for Jackson Street School. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And actually, um, folk, if folks will just stay, um, is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, so I'm going to move into the regular meeting, and I'm actually going to ask if we could take. She, Hillary signed up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Hillary. I'm sorry, uh, Hillary. Hillary Gardner. My apologies. There was a cluster of people who are all in that group, so my my mistake. No, I'm not the cluster. I'm no like the cloud on the on the rainbows Thank you. here tonight. Um, because my name's Hillary Gardner. I reside at 56 Meadow Street. I'm a parent of a sixth grader at JFK. Some of you know who happens to be 11 years old and. Um, I am here to talk about the introduction of junk food in JFK and not solely the introduction of junk food um, on a daily basis at 1045 in the morning, which is when lunch, quote unquote, lunch is for my son, but also the manner in which it was introduced, which is this is what went home to parents. Um, I know, having been a teacher, and a lot of you might know the difference between fact and opinion, and I was given a document full of opinion, good news, new and exciting. I was given no document with any kind of information about what snacks were actually going to be on sale. Several of us, many who couldn't be here today, um, made the false assumption that frozen treats meant fruit bars because we have long been fighting sugar and obesity in our children, when in fact this is what went on sale to the 11-year-olds at JFK. Now, nutritionists, Dr. Provost, do recommend eating a rainbow of <laughs> colors of food on a child's plate, but I don't think that this is the rainbow that they had in mind. So I've been doing, trying to do a lot of digging to learn more about this issue, and you can see that some of these items, like the crumbled cookie cone, are marked WG for whole grain because they are 51% whole grain. The cr cookie crumble is 51% whole grain. In my mind, 51% is not a passing grade. So a lot of parents want to know why we are moving backwards at this point of time, um, why we're making money, because I understand that it's a budget issue, why we're making money off on the backs of our kids' health. And I'm particularly concerned about that uh, because we're not even going to, this program isn't even going to make back the debt in food services, in my understanding. So we're selling junk food to kids for a dollar a pop. Um, we don't even sell it at a high price. <laughs> And, you know, we know, and I have a few pages of statistics about what sugar, obesity, and um, can do to kids. I can tell you in my own family, uh, speaking of family members, nieces and nephews, uh, autism, diabetes, asthma, kidney disease, and attention disorder. So this is the first generation, they say, that will not be healthier or live longer than their parents. So I'm really concerned that this happened secretly under the radar around spring break. I don't understand how something as serious as this 
could not be a part of public education, you know, public conversation. Um, I, I don't understand why the facts were hidden and I understand that some changes are being made, um, but there still seems to be no communication going forward to parents about what's going on and why. And uh, I think we would all appreciate more transparency and that the school committee re revisit this issue. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you very much, Ms. Kerr. Okay, is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, so um, uh, our, our colleague, Ms. Hennessy, um, I'm going to actually ask if we can take item O out of order um, and bring it up to the front. Um, and that is, the, um, that is the order regarding the, uh, the next reading um, for the uh, naming of the Jackson Street Greenhouse in honor of Mary Bates. So I'll turn Great. to my colleague, Ann Hennessy. So this is a fourth reading, um, so we will vote on that, and I would like to make a motion after that. But um, this is, as we all beautifully heard so many people speak on behalf of this naming of the greenhouse on um, Mary Bates before she retires. Um, so this is our fourth reading. Okay. This is a vote. Okay. So are you making your I'll motion? to vote to approve okay. um, the naming of the Jackson Street Greenhouse. Okay. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. I'd also like to move to suspend the rules and have a final vote on this um, to vote for the approval this evening. Okay. So there's been a motion to suspend our rules, um, to, to dispense with the additional readings, to make the final uh, naming uh, official tonight. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. Um, any, <laughs> any other discussion or thoughts or comments? Um, when we suspend the rules, it does have to be a two-thirds vote, right? That is correct, yes. Um, so this is on the motion to suspend rules. Um, uh, and to make the final approval. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So, it is now official. Uh, congratulations, Mary, and thank you for all your work and this great legacy that the Greenhouse will provide to many future generations at Jackson Street School. Could you... Speech? Do you want to... Do you want to say something, Mary? Do you want to? <laughs> Maybe your attorney wants to speak. <laughs> you know, for those who don't know, Mary was a lawyer uh -huh. long before me. That's true. <laughs> and a better true. one. Um, it's really an honor to be here um, among friends and among colleagues. I appreciate the leadership of our schools. Uh, so much, and that leadership has been instrumental in, in promoting a garden program, an outdoor classroom program in our schools. Um, I want to particularly thank the Northampton Education Foundation, who provided the funding for the first garden at Jackson Street back in 2009, and have continued to support the garden program that is now in all the elementary schools in our district, um, so that every child can enjoy being outdoors and exploring in an authentic um, environment uh, for science, but also social studies and literacy and math. And I want to thank in particular our PTOs and the members of our PTOs who have been so instrumental in funding, and not only in, in funding, um, helping to fund the garden program, but also with their time and commitment in going out on the work days and building the greenhouse and building raised beds and building um, platforms for the, for, the, for the seedlings to grow on. It's been an incredible experience. And um, I was in the greenhouse today, actually, with my first graders, and we were transplanting plants into larger pots. And it was a wonderful space. So I'm very grateful um, for all of that. And thank you so much for your support and for your uh, honor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we'll now return uh, back to the regular agenda. Um, are there announcements from members of the school committee? Um, oh. Ms. Busansky and then Ms. Hennessy. 
Thanks. Uh, I just want to announce um, to help spread the word that the Northampton Mayor's Summer Youth Works Program is now open and accepting applications until June 1st. And it's a summer employment opportunity for kids between the ages of 14 and 21 years old. There are income eligibility requirements. I know at the high school, there, um, I believe Ms. Malvesi is helping folks or helping lead folks to where they can get help in filling out the applications if there's any questions about it. But it's a great opportunity to get meaningful summer employment for our youth. So applications are due June 1st, and more information is on the Community Action website. So. Ms. Hennessy. I just want, this is an announcement um, for all of the members. If uh, you have feedback for the superintendent's evaluation, <coughs> some new rules, um, this just recently put down. And so if you give feedback in written form, it, send it to Laura and it will be on our public um, website. Okay. Do you have an announcement? Please. Um, I, I would like to announce that the NHS theater um, there'll, be, there'll be two shows that are capstone projects from our seniors at the high school. The effects of gamma rays and Man on the Moon Marigolds is next week, um, Thursday, Friday, two shows on Saturday. That play is for um, people 12 and up is what they're recommending because um, of the adult, uh, some of the adult themes. And then the following week on Thursday and Friday, 12th night will be performed and they are really phenomenal shows so I hope that the public comes out and supports the NHS theater. Ms. Fallon. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that Saturday is the 22nd annual um, Northampton Education Foundation um, plant and garden market. It's um, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Smith Vocational School. All the money raised goes to um, the Support Our Schools SOS Book Fund um, and if you have plants to donate, you can still donate them by bringing them to Smith um, Vocational School between 4 and 7 p.m. on um, Friday, tomorrow. Excellent. Any other announcements? Oh, Mr. Moore. It's very much like Laura Founds. It's an NEF-related thing. The showcase for the NEF, which highlights all of the projects that they have funded over the last year, is going to be Friday, June 8th from 5.30 to 7.30 at Click Space in, um, or Click Workspace on Market Street, no? I think we changed it to it's the changed? new, the arts uh, building. I think it's at 33 Holly Street. Well, it might be a 33, the okay. Arts Trust building. Okay, the Arts Trust building. Still the same date, same night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just down the block. Right, the other, across the street. Any other announcements from the school committee? Okay, hearing none, we'll move into the recommended actions portion of the agenda. We do have a consent agenda this evening that includes the approval of minutes <coughs> of the school committee meeting of September 14th, 2017, the rules and policy subcommittee of April 11th, 2018, um, we, our special school committee meeting on May 2nd, 2018, we also have budget transfer approvals uh, to cover deficits primarily in special education, tutoring and substitutes. We also have a series of field trip requests, the Bridge Street second grade uh, going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut, June 1st. The JFK Recyclones uh, sixth grade going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut on June 6th. The JFK Sun Devils sixth grade going to the Connecticut Science Center on Hartford, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut on June 8th. The NHS track team going to the New England Track Championships in Durham, New Hampshire on June 9th, 2018. And then finally, the JFK Hybrid Huskies, um, sixth grade, uh, going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut on June 15th, 2018. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. Next, we move to reports and recommendations, and we have a report from our uh, student representative, um, Elena Fragamini. Hi, good evening. You guys had a very robust announcement section. Yes. <laughs> My report is a little reduced. Well. <laughs> um, uh, so the school year is winding down for seniors. Our last official day of school is, I believe, May 30th. I think that's correct, um, that week. Um, and as 
Molly mentioned, Ms. Burnham mentioned, um, there are some amazing senior capstone plays happening as well as presentations of some of this amazing capstone work that our seniors have been putting on, both in the theater department, um, but also they're holding recitals and talks and screenings. Um, and these are really amazing ways to uh, showcase the passionate work that they've been doing. It's really a culmination of their experience in our school district. So I encourage you to go see those plays as an example of those that capstone work. Um, on the capstone theme, the Northamptons have their last show of the year on May 29th at the Iron Horse Music Hall, where they will perform, say goodbye to seniors, and welcome a new group of tones. Um, tickets can be purchased through the Iron Horse box office. Last week was Pride Week at Northampton High. Uh, the Gender Sexuality Alliance ran a week of themes and events at NHS, including a really lovely wall where kids could write how they support the LGBTQ plus community, um, a day of silence, and then a, a silence breaking party, um, and ended with a huge float in the Pride Parade. Uh, tomorrow from 5 to 7 p.m. there will be a reception at Forbes Library for a Northampton High student art exhibition. I encourage you all to attend and see this amazing collection of paintings, drawings, and ceramics by NHS art students. Um, on Monday, April 30th, the Student Union held a well-attended forum on the question of NHS's AP testing policy. We heard some great feedback from teachers, parents, students, and community members, and we'll use that to continue to inform our process in working on this issue. We invite anyone who was unable to attend the forum to reach out to the Student Union, Superintendent Provost, or Principal Brian Lombardi with their thoughts and opinion on this topic. Um, this meeting is my last with the Northampton School Committee. Um, I just want to extend my sincere thanks to this committee for welcoming me and to the NHS community for working with me to represent them for the past two years. Um, it has been a pleasure and an honor, so thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. On behalf of the school committee, let me just thank you. It's been such a great pleasure and honor to have you on our school committee. Um, you have really in, in contributed to and informed our debates and discussions, and um, uh, so it's going to be sad to see you go. And um, and so thank you so much again for, for all your active involvement in this process and all your active involvement in, at NHS. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a second reading um, and this is a request uh, to name the basketball <coughs> court at Ryan Road uh, Legends Court and we have from League Legends um, Michael O'Brien um, who uh, was just hosted at a, a wonderful uh, um, I don't know, grand opening. Uh, it was a, a dedication, dedication ceremony, ceremony, not a naming ceremony. Not a naming ceremony. <laughs> so, <laughs> dedication. That's right. That's right. That's right. Careful. Uh, yes. water so, um, uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm Michael O'Brien. I live at 70 Acre Brook Drive, Florence, and I'm the executive director of League Legends. And a lot of you may remember me from over a year ago now, where you uh, basically granted us permission to build a memorial basketball court at Ryan Road School. And thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, so the, the project is completed. Um, we actually held a dedication uh, on Sunday as a dedication to David Holman and Miles Dudley Adams. And those are friends of mine who sort of the court was always meant to be a tribute to while serving a very practical function of, you know, being a community resource. Um, the reason we want to name it Legends Court is because we used to play in the league. It was like our little pickup basketball group there. And so Miles and David were the original legends of the league along with the rest of us. So that was kind of our little group, is the legends of the league. And so it's a subtle tribute to them and to the people that kind of built the court. And we wanted to keep it subtle. We didn't want to name it specifically after them because that would bring up sometimes some maybe more somber memories than the families would prefer. So this is kind of why we went with Legends Court as opposed to naming it directly after them. And obviously, you know, Legends Court does kind of sound good. So those little legends that are playing <laughs> on the basketball court will feel kind of cool and feel kind of empowered and then kind of create their own little legend. That's actually something we kind of like. We thought that was a cool idea. So for those that know the origin of Legends Court, it's a really, really good story. And for those that don't know it, it's still a really powerful name. And honestly, we'll be at the court quite a bit, maintaining it and hosting events to tell that story to people to kind of remind them where Legends Court came from and how it came to be. And Thank you for being a part of that. So I'm kind of here to answer any questions if you have any, but I, I don't want to hold you guys up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for coming. I know a few of you did, so I yeah, appreciate it. Was you a really, uh, moving. It was a great day, first of all, of basketball when the when it was raining. <laughs> uh, uh, came in, but it was a really a moving, um, moving thank you. dedication, and just it was great to to have the families there 
and um, I just thank you for all the hard work and yeah. teamwork and um, yeah. just really an inspiring tribute to your former classmates. And we have a, we have a second win coming, it won't be right away, but we're already excited to partner with the, the Ryan Road PTO and the, actually the, um, the Garden Club over there too in some future projects because we're neighbors now, so. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right, well. So, um, are, are there any other questions? Mr. Coff. It's not a question, but I just want to point out that um, I was at, I had the opportunity to attend last Sunday. It was a super event. Michael's being a little um, humble. I mean, it was packed. There was mm. so <laughs> many people there, and I think it was for League of Legends. It might have been to watch our mayor play basketball in his suit and sneakers, <laughs> which was for me probably the most memorable. Thing. <laughs> I, had to, um, I had to try it out. And we'll get we'll get you a jersey. We'll so, make it easier next time. So. But more so, League of Legends is um, you know it's a it's a nonprofit we have. It's a hundred percent volunteer based. They've been working on this for years and years, um, and it's just amazing. I was talking to Elaine's mom, who was at the ceremony, and I was describing like me coming down Ryan Road at night because I do often, and after you know wherever it gets dark. And it's a quiet road, and you're coming up to the school, and I typically just turn left anyway. But now you turn left, and you, you see these lights, these bright lights beaming down on the court with a lot of people playing basketball. And Lena's mom said, it's just like the natural. That, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, if you build it, there will come. It's not quite as, as uh, rural, the space. But it does give you just a tremendous feel. So if you haven't had that opportunity, give it a, give it a shot. It's really nice. And, uh, I assume during the summer there'll be more and more people playing there, and it's yeah. just you, that's the expectation. A lot of the kids yeah. coming back from college, it was kind of the target demographic. So we've designed it, you know, to have adjustable hoops for the little ones at recess, and they've been playing on it quite a bit. But then after school, it goes to a full-size basketball court, yeah. and so it's you know a court that people can grow with. And I hope now a landmark in the community is kind of what we're shooting for. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank okay. you, Mr. Kaufman. Would you like to make a motion? To what? Um, this is for the uh, second reading on the naming of Legends Court. Yes, but not, okay, so it's just the second reading. Yes, that's correct. All right, well, I'll be happy to uh, propose, make a motion that this is, that we approve the second reading. Yeah, that's, tonight is the scheduled second reading yes. of the Legends Court. Yes. The Legends Court, thank you. Yes, the sir. Legends Court. Legends Court, yes. yes. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? You don't, you don't know another meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. We're having a reading. I apologize. Sorry. My bad. Be happy to make the uh, ultimate sort of vote. That's perfect. Yeah, we, we'll have a few more readings till we make that reading. So, if I'd like to add, I, I know that I, there's you know a lot of this courts are, or these things are normally named after people, so it's not specifically after a person. But there's no trademark or copyright infringements. I've kind of been looking into it, so just to, okay. so you know that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so that's our second reading. Sorry. Um, so I was in a voting mood tonight. So uh, <laughs> here's one. What's that? Okay. So now we have some votes coming up, some actual votes coming up. Uh, this is a um, proposed athletic trip, the girls' ultimate frisbee team going to the American Equity Invite Tournament in Leesburg, Virginia. June 2nd to the 3rd, 2018. Um, because this is not uh, this is not a, a recurring trip, a new it's a new trip. Um, we do have our athletic director, uh, Ms. Dupree, here. And if you wanted to come up uh, and um, just let us know a little bit about this. Thank you for having me this evening. I'm really excited to advocate on behalf of the Girls Ultimate Frisbee program this evening. Um, we have tonight with us Clar Clarissa Lyons, who is our um, head coach as well. Um, and she really has been the driving force behind getting this up and running and, and advocating for our girls to make this trip. Um, the American Equity Invite is in their first year. This is the, the first year of their tournament. And it will be held in Leesburg, Virginia. Um, it will be hosted by the H.B. Woodlawn High School, which is out of Arlington, Virginia. And um, their uh, real goal is to offer uh, an ultimate Frisbee tournament that is reasonably priced for kids and, and schools to be able to attend, but is also a really high caliber, um, exciting opportunity for students from all over, um, all over the country to be able to go and, and meet new people and see new competition and also go to a new place. Um, the, our student athletes, uh, the tournament will be all day on June 2nd and June 3rd. Currently, we would like our student athletes and our four chaperones to <coughs> fly out on uh, Friday, June 1st from Bradley International Airport at um, just shy of 8 o'clock. They will um, arrive at Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. Um, a little after 9. 
and we've worked with Joy Winnie to um, make sure we understand the transportation policy and the, uh, our opportunity to rent uh, vans so that once we get to Washington, D.C., we can transport our students from there to, um, to our host. Um, our host, Mr. Brooks, is the uncle of one of our student athletes who is um, uh, willing and uh, I think able to host all 20 of our students and and the, our chaperones for the the two nights the three days that they'll be there um, they will then return on f on Sunday evening after the the full weekend of the tournament um, flying out of Dulles uh, right after five o'clock and returning to Bradley International Airport um, about 640 um, the Tournament itself is uh, costs three hundred dollars for the student for our students to register, and um, it, the rental vans are just under a thousand dollars, including an estimate around uh, with gasoline. Um, the ultimate frisbee gift account, which is um, organized or hosted by this our school department, um, and um, has been funded by previous donations, um, will help cover the cost of registration and the rental vans. Anything that's not covered will be covered by the athletic revolving account and then the student athletes and their families are are responsible for paying for their flight and their um, their food while they are away um, we have three parent volunteers who are going to go with our students they uh, were organizing the um, all of the Cory paperwork and also the transportation paperwork so that they are able to drive our student athletes um, we've also been in contact with Mr. Brooks, who is going to share his, all of his Corey paperwork so that we're making sure that um, our kids are safe and taken well care of while they're gone. Um, and um, I think that's it. Okay. Questions? Any questions? Uh, for, oh. Sure. I mean, this sounds like an, an amazing and well-planned trip and a great opportunity. I was just wondering to, to hear kind of why, why this tournament? Why Virginia? Why? So, um, one, we were invited to attend, which is a really great opportunity because um, that means that our our program has made a name for itself in a really positive way. Part of that is because we also um, invite over 500, I think it's closer to 600 students and their families from all over New England, New Jersey, and New York to come to our uh, Pioneer Valley Invitational, uh, which will be in a couple of weeks at the Oxbow. And so, our ultimate frisbee program has really made a really positive name for itself with those folks and then just sort of it's spread and so they've they invited us to attend so it's a, a great honor it is the first year of this tournament so um, we're hoping that it will it'll be an opportunity for us to go back um, and, and repeat in years to come um, it's also one of their missions is really to create an inclusive environment for all students and to offer to offer the opportunity of ultimate frisbee to to anybody who's interested. So it's a great um, they have a great mission as well. Ms. Burnham. Um, what is happening if there's families that can't pay the transportation? So the uh, the invitational the the organizers have actually offered to um, help fund for those students who can't afford it, and then also parents and families who can't afford it can speak to me, and we can organize an opportunity to pay for it, whether it's through that booster account that we have or through the athletic revolving. Can I do a follow up question? Sure. Sorry, um, and then just out of curiosity, sort of. I guess as like a as a policy, mm -hmm. how often do teams travel that far, and is it sort of the same policy so that people are responsible if you do travel that far that they're responsible for the travel and then you guys chip in and help or what's the so this is the first time in my four years that we're sending students this far. Um, I'm not sure of the history of sending folks further away before me. Um, we have sent uh, students in the past to Cooperstown, New York, um, and also uh, you already agreed or consented to um, uh, the New England Track Championships in New Hampshire. So this is a little bit further out for us, um, but I think it's a really great opportunity for our kids to be exposed to, um, to new people and a new place and, and uh, maybe broaden their experience a little bit more, so. Okay. Um, Ms. Frangamini. Um, is the entire girls ultimate program or is it just varsity so um, all of the students were invited to attend and um, but they're not required to attend so uh, currently we have two students who are not going to um, not going to make the trip and we have 20 students who have agreed to to make the trip 
Mr. Brooks have like a large farm or something? It's <laughs> an excellent farm. question because it's not only 20 student athletes, it's 20 female student athletes. So I'm interested in, in finding out the details of how big his home is. But okay. um, he, is, he is offered very graciously. Um, and I think that's also part of the culture, I think, of Ultimate Frisbee. We have over 500 students coming from all over the place in a couple weeks, and many of them are staying with host families so that they can come and, and afford it and be able to stay for the weekend. So I think it's also a little bit part of that sort of inclusive environment that they create. Excellent. Great. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ms. Is it all is it all female? Is it all girls teams or is it I believe so. Yes. Thank and you. is that part of the mission to kind of highlight girls yes. athleticism? Mm -hmm. Which also links to um, uh, a clinic that we had earlier in the winter to be able to expose more girls to ultimate frisbee as well so it helps further that idea around here for us too okay so if there are no other questions um, I would entertain a motion to approve this uh, this trip motion to approve the athletic trip girls ultimate frisbee to American equity invite second okay. so there's been a motion made and seconded any other uh, questions or discussion Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, congratulations and have a great trip. Thank you very much. Good luck, Coach. Yeah, <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so the next item on the agenda is a proclamation. Um, and uh, uh, this is a proclamation, um, actually, uh, was uh, for, well, it's for National School Nurse Day. Um, it is May 9th, 2018. Um, we had the, yesterday was the official day, but tonight was our meeting, so it seemed like a great opportunity um, to invite uh, Ms. Jarvis Vance and her amazing nursing team uh, from our school system to be here uh, for, the, for the proclamation. So, whereas children are the future, and by investing in them today, we are ensuring our world for tomorrow, and whereas all students have a right to have their health needs safely while in the school setting, and whereas children today face more complex and life-threatening health problems requiring care in school, and whereas school nurses have served a critical role in improving public health and ensuring students' academic success for more than 100 years, and whereas school nurses are professional nurses that advance the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievements of all students by serving on the front lines and providing a critical safety net for our nation's most fragile children. And whereas school nurses act as a liaison to the school community, parents, and healthcare providers on behalf of children's health by promoting wellness and improving health outcomes for our nation's children. And whereas school nurses support the health and educational success of children and youth by providing access to care when children's cognitive development is at its peak. And whereas school nurses are members of school-based mental health teams, and whereas school nurses understand the link between health and learning and are in a position to make a positive difference for children every day. So now therefore I, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor of the City of Northampton, do hereby proclaim National School Nurse Day. Let us acknowledge the accomplishments of school nurses and their efforts to meet the needs of today's students by improving the delivery of health care in our schools. Let us thank them for contributing to local communities by helping students stay healthy, in school, and ready to learn, and by helping to keep parents and guardians at work. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the City of Northampton, Mayor David Narkowitz. So, congratulations. Thank you. And, um, I can uh, provide you <coughs> an official copy of this. Uh, that would be afternoon. great. All right. So and the floor I, is yours. Thank you. And I wouldn't be me if I didn't have something to say. Yes. Uh, but I'm not going to dazzle you with statistics like I normally do because I did create the infographic that you have in front of you, which also went out on social media. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, one statistic I do want to point out there is our 94% return to class rate, which is pretty impressive when you consider we see about 35,000 students every year. And that's higher than the state average, which is usually around 92%. Um, and a couple other things I wanted to talk about is the changing role of school nursing or what the 
school nursing looks like now. It's very different than when, even when I started 20 something years ago working in schools as a health professional. And more and more often we're called upon to do case management for students with very complex medical issues that we were not seeing attending public school 20, 30, 40 years ago. So in our schools we have had students with, uh, we do have students with uh, insulin pumps, glucose, uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices, tracheostomies, colostomies, G-tubes, central venous lines, total parenteral nutrition, and if you don't know what some of those things are, that's okay because we do. <laughs> and we've got it. Um, I can't stress enough how much work goes into managing some of these students and uh, the dedication that my staff has in, in doing this in addition to all the normal and sometimes not so normal things that we see every day as well as immunization compliance and disease surveillance and giving everyone their flu shots and medication administration. Um, it's become a really, really huge job. So tonight I just want to recognize I brought a few, a few of my staff with me to accept the prop proclamation. And right here you have Ms. Karen Schiaffo, who is the nurse here at JFK Middle School and a recent a recipient of a master's in nursing uh, education from Elms College. Um, Ms. Deb Raniak, who is our traveling nurse and probably knows every single student. I think she does. She knows every single student in our system and is our uh, health information management system, our electronic health record guru. Couldn't do it without her. And Ms. Kana Goyette, who's our, the newest member of our team at Northampton High School, who is currently attending Elms College in their graduate program, Master's in Nursing, with a concentration in school nursing. So I just want to recognize them and all of our other staff uh, tonight, and thank you very much for taking the time uh, to do the proclamation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to our, to our school nurses. Um, <coughs> next item on the agenda is a vote uh, regarding a memorandum of understanding with the city uh, regarding our um, uh, electric bike share station uh, to be located at Northampton High School. And I believe uh, Principal Lombardi is at, the, uh, is at the podium. Yes, good evening everybody, thanks for having me. Um, so I take it you've had a chance to look at the first um, MOU. It's this, I was approached by um, Wayne Fiden probably um, three months ago. Um, I guess in the Northampton they're proposing bringing I think 14 to 16 stations around the community. And he felt that um, a logical spot would be close to the high school, um, create like a transportation hub with the, um, the bus depot right there, um, as well as our students. Um, and we, I thought it was a great idea. We already have a bike share program. I did check with Kate Dollard, who started the bike share program. Um, did not, didn't want to compete with that, it's something that she had initiated a few years ago, and she was all on board as well. Um, I think this will give a lot of our students a lot of potential opportunities. Um, they have programs that um, will allow all students to access it for free and reduced lunch opportunities. You can buy passes, I believe, um, for a year for like $90 or something like that. Um, so I imagine for some students that might be a great way to get around town. I'd like to be able to tap into that for students, maybe getting to internships or work studies even. So I think there's a lot of potential for finding ways for the students to get integrated into the community. I also think it speaks to the values of um, the community at large. Many of my teachers bike, many school committee members. Howard bike all over the place. Um, so I think, it, I think it really ties into you know, something that, that is um, near and dear to Northampton. I think it would be great to have that on, on school grounds. Excellent. Um, are there any, um, any questions about the MOU? Yes, Mr. Moore. If, that, if somebody is not mentioned in the MOU, um, helmets. Are helmets um, required for the use of these bikes? That, I don't believe so. No. What's that? Yeah, the, the way the bike share stations are set up, there are not helmets. Um, I think the understanding is that people who will, you know, want to want to ride and rent a bike will bring a helmet with or them. Or not. Or not. 
Um, it's one of the just ways the model works. I don't know that they've been able to figure out a way to secure them and secure them and rent helmets <coughs> and deal with health issues right. and the sizing and things like that. So, um, yeah. So I think that's yeah. Yeah, there aren't any helmets. Well, I'm, the only reason I'm asking is because it seems like helmets are fairly expensive. And um, if we're going to be promoting our students riding bicycles, we might need to figure out. It would be good if we could figure out some way to support them owning a helmet. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Ms. Fragamini. Um, just on the on the helmet question, does the NHS Bike Share provide helmets? The one that Ms. Dollard runs. I so, but I can't, I'm not 100 percent sure. So don't hold me to that. I can find that out and send an email out to you. Okay. Other questions about. Um, I just want to say I thank you so much for working with our planning department on this. Um, you know, we are working as a as part of a five community uh, collaborative to yeah. do these bike share throughout the Pioneer Valley, and so um, we, we're going to have other stations along Route Nine, including at John M. Green Hall, at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, in downtown Florence, in downtown Northampton, and then other uh, locations throughout the city. So um, we really think it's going to be a great way for people who want to. You know, see the see the city by bike and use it as an alternative to transportation, uh, an alternative transportation method. That it'll be great and be great to have it at this hub, um, particularly for people at the Bay State and just other people to have access to the network. So, um, so I would entertain a motion to approve the MOU. This motion point. to approve the MOU uh, with the city on electric bike share station at Northampton High School. Second. Second. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, the station is electrified because it has to, it's a charging station, so there'll be electricity run to yep. um, And the bikes are electric <coughs> assist. They're a little bit different, but yep. okay. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any, any exceptions? Okay, uh, that is approved. Great. Okay. The uh, next item on the agenda is another MOU involving uh, NHS with uh, Mr. Lombardi. It's an MOA, a memorandum of agreement uh, with clinical support options, CSO, uh, regarding the use of NPS space to provide outpatient services to NHS students. Yes. Yeah. Turn this over. So we have found um, over the last couple of years um, an increase, and you can even when uh, Ms. Jarvis was talking about the nursing staff now dealing with mental health issues being part of the mental health team, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a growing need within high schools. Um, we're also finding that there's a, a very small percentage, about 1% of our population, that as we identify, they have very significant clinical needs that are impacting attendance, behavior, and academic success, that we can do our job um, call in their supports, make recommendations, make connections with outside resources, but for a variety of things beyond our control, and many times their control, they're, not at, they're unable to access an outside um, patient um, relationship and for intakes, for an ongoing relationship. And so what happens, we're dealing and seeing the same old, the same negative impacts of mental health issues impacting, and we're trying to find a way to bring it to them, trying to think creative outside of the box. And we think that by, we've had conversations with CSO, that we think that this would be a great addition to our um, supports for our students, especially our, mo our highest needs, our highest risk students, to um, help them find specific success. I think we believe that until this, this is a part of the struggle that these students are having and they will not, they will be unable to access educational opportunities at the school. So that's really the gist of it. I can ask any questions, but that really is the gist of what we're trying to do. Okay. Are there any questions about the MOA? Yes, Ms. I just want to say that I think that this is so great and it's the sort of um, engagement that makes such a difference for kids and I like how you thought about having it more at the end of the day to support if things come up. I, I just felt like it was, it's, it's really, it's yeah. really good stuff. Thank you. Other comments, Ms. Hennessy? Oh, and I'm sorry. Okay. It's your job. I think this is wonderful. And I like the 130. The only thing, um, as someone who works in the districts where we have this, um, being pulled out at the same time in the same class sometimes is tricky for kids. We would, our, our goal is to be as flexible as possible great. with That's this. Great. So, so it really is going to be based on the needs of the student and we have to be flexible. And so we, we would try to. That's, that's the only thing. I, yeah. I love this. It's perfect. Thank you. Mr. Moore? 
Yeah, um, my, my question is, I, um, I understand this is sort of an introductory idea, but sure. um, there are a lot of other providers um, besides CSO. And um, some students may actually, them, their provider may not be a CSO provider, but they may um, have similar, would receive a similar benefit by being able to have a space there. Is that, is that something that we are thinking about in terms of being able to have similar MOAs with other providers? I think this, this is more of an ongoing relationship. At times, Northampton High School, as do some, some of other schools, when a situation arises with a student that for some particular re reason, um, that, that does happen occasionally, it, but it's not an ongoing thing. I don't think we're looking to open the door for all students. You know, again, this is a very unique um, population of students that do not have the resources, the abilities to make those connections um, outside. Um, so again, right now this is for that, but I think you said it's new, it's a trial. I think we have to get a sense of how this works and reevaluate. That, that's why this is only for a year, I believe, so that we can um, get a better understanding the successes and things like that. Mr. Cobb. Oh, God. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're I, used to that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is such a, it, it just makes great sense, and I've also seen schools do this, and they, they talk about the success, so thank you for doing this. I'm wondering, what, in a year from now, what, how will you know whether this has made an impact? What, what are you hoping, what's the major sort of objectives that you have in mind that you yeah. think this is going to make a, a positive change? I for? think, obviously, as an educator, we're hoping to see some change in the school with academic, behavioral, or attendance success. I think on the, on the bare minimum, as we know, some of these things are, are long-term, is students making a connection with the resource that can have some continuity. Uh, many of these students, their experiences um, with mental health are either non-existent or they happen and they're very inconsistent. So if we could get something where a student makes contact, um, the goal would be for this to transfer outside. That, that things become established that they no longer need, need to have this functioning in the, in the school. Yeah. That, would say, that would say a lot about functionality for, for the student. So is there any way we can track that? I mean, attendance, just like you said at a bare minimum, having kids attend and and I think all those things, you know, we can, we can track attendance. We can basically, between work and CSO, we can get a sense of, you know, what, what is the continuity of the, um, the service happening at the school, um, what happens over the summer, and then we could see, do things begin to navigate um, Again, I think it depends on the student who we're tracking. So some students, it might be just the fact that they're meeting weekly or every other week. You know, for some students, it might be we've had them for three months and then they begin to take it and it's happening outside of school. Um, so I think it really depends on where, where are the things for each individual right. um, that we'd be looking at for a mode of success. Very individualized. Good. Well, I look forward to looking at that data and thank sure. you so much again for doing this. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Principal Lombardi? Okay. Make a motion to approve the MOA with clinical support options regarding use of Northampton Public Schools. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been seconded. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say <coughs> aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the uh, motion to approve the MOA is approved. Um, we have one more for you, Mr. Lombardi. Um, this is a vote for the NHS Summer School Credit Recovery Program fee. Sure. Um, so we haven't had a summer school um, opportunity for students, I think, um, for the last eight years. Um, we used to have a summer school program that was funded through the um, D Department of Education uh, Academic Support Grant. And that slowly went away. Um, and since then, we haven't had any opportunities for any type of credit recovery. Um, now we're seeing students, for a variety of re reasons, are in situations that need credit recovery. Some of it is because of academic failure. Um, academic failure, but that could be from attendance issues. It can be from hospitalizations, mental health issues, environmental things. They're just causing students at some point that um, are falling behind with um, academics. So our hope was to use a format that we have, Edgenuity, uh, which would be able to support students. Um, again, summer school is not meant to be a repeat of the class. It's meant to be there's been some success and you're, you're building on that. Um, but we would use Edgenuity as our format um, where students could also self-pace doing at home. We'd also be able to spread it out for the whole summers. Most typical summer schools run for the month of July. So we, we'd be looking to expand it for July and August, having drop-in times <coughs> during the week, um, two days, Tuesday and Thursday for um, nine to 12 drop-in. So students could then self-pace. We were really trying to 
some students are going to want to come on campus and get that support. Some students might not be able to because maybe um, conditions still going on or some might want a combination. Um, so to do this and to have a staff person, um, a teacher, be available, we need to charge a price. Um, so we've looked around at summer school prices and for the staffing we'd be looking at, as you can see, a um, hundred dollar participation fee for all students, twenty-five dollars for students um, with reduced lunch, and zero um, for students with free lunch. Okay. Are there any questions uh, from Ms. Lombardi about this? And Ms. Hennessy? I have and one question. I just want to know your reasoning. It's not why did you go with the passing of one term versus an average for the requirement? Is that how you? Yeah, um, that, that's pretty much how we've always done it, feeling that we wanted to at least have one quarter of academic success. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and, what, and typically to have an average of p passing, you probably have to have passing one quarter, correct? No, I guess I, I could see a student having a 59 average. What's your passing? I forget. 50, 60, um, six, 50, 50, 60's passing. Yeah. Right, so yeah. 59 average, never having passed a term, but I could also see mm -hmm. someone having a 53 average. So someone having a higher, it doesn't matter. I just sure. want to know what your thinking was yeah. on that. I think, I think it's one, it's, I hate saying it, it's what we've always done. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think most importantly, because summer school is not, it was meant to be you're not repeating the class because you totally failed. There has been a level of success. There's an understanding of some skills and concepts, and it's meant more to, to be to support those gaps that are there. And the, the hope is by having at least a, um, a successful quarter, you're more likely to have the skills, the essential skills, to be successful with the other part of the class. Mr. Kaufman. So thank you again. Um, and is there additional fees for us for a student to take a course through engineering? Besides the hundred dollars, is that does that include the fee for taking the course itself? Yeah, that, that's everything. We've, we've already purchased that genuity. Okay. Yeah. This is only going to be the 1470 is an estimation of the um, teacher right. based on the, um, the, the contract um, hours. Okay. So there's no additional cost for nope. ingenuity. And so do you, will you be able to find a teacher? This is a teacher that will need to support kids in all different course areas. That's well, a challenge. If you approve this, then I can go forward with this. And we're hoping. So this is in contingency. So the yeah. first thing before we went out there, um, we, we believe so. Okay. Good. Well, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Musansky. I'm just curious on the brochure itself, there's an asterisk for, you know, available for credit recovery. And so some classes that are on there that aren't available for credit recovery, like World History One, World History Two, do you see where I'm? Well, I see World History. So these course offerings, yep. Yep. Right, course offerings, and some have asterisks, and at the bottom says an asterisk is available for credit recovery. That, I'll have to get an answer for you. Yeah, I'm not, okay. okay. I just was curious if they're all, I kind of assumed they were all credit. Yes. Right, okay. So it's probably just a. I think a typo. Like yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Okay. Any other questions? I would entertain a motion. A motion to approve the NHS Summer School Credit Recovery Program. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any, uh, anyone abstaining? Okay, that passes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lombardi. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Much appreciated. <coughs> Next, we have a discussion. Uh, this is a, uh, item H. This is a discussion of our executive session meeting times. Uh, this was something requested by our colleague, Mr. Kaufman. And I note that we're not, it's now still a relatively early hour. So uh, <laughs> yes, you deferred last time on this discussion. So, uh, so I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. And I really don't know how long it's going to take, but just by way of um, intro, I just thought at some point maybe as a committee we need to discuss whether uh, having our executive sessions uh, always scheduled after our public sessions makes sense. And I ran the idea by the chairs and said, you know, how do we even do this? And they recommended I um, research this and add a discussion item to the school committee meeting. So I researched it and this is our opportunity for discussion. Um, so my main reason, honestly, to come up with this is really just to avoid late meetings whenever we can. Um, I think I get somewhat bleary-eyed. I think that we can 
we can run more um, any sort of discussions or have meetings if we're, if we're awake and ready to go. And sometimes these meetings run pretty late. Uh, secondary to that, and I do think it would help um, those who need to get up early, including the educators, teachers who might be participating, the attorney who might be participating, and the educators and others that wake up early on our school committee um, who are waking up at 6 o'clock, 5.30 to get ready earlier. to teach uh, earlier. Um, <laughs> maybe there's a benefit to changing. So um, a few things to consider. Um, when I first brought this up, uh, Dr. Provost surveyed some superintendents and let me know that he found that, uh, I think amongst his results, that most, most superintendents, most school, committee, school committees are running their meetings right after the public meeting. There was executive sessions. Um, a good number of executive sessions will also run earlier. I think you said over 30. Sounds about right. Yeah, so I don't know how many total, not the majority, but it's not that rare either. I then spoke to Lisa Minnick, who um, served on the school committee, you guys know, for over 20 years. And I asked her whether we had ever done this before, whether we had any track record of doing it. She recalled that that former school committee certainly have, she said, before meetings, uh, on another day, and even weekends. She remembered this quite clearly. So I asked her whether any problems had arose um, by having meetings on those other days. And she did, not, she did not recall. She wasn't aware of any problems. But she did bring up a number of considerations that certainly we need to be aware of if we were going to do it. I think those um, I'll discuss in a second. So I got to thinking, you know, for this discussion, the most, you know, one option I thought would make the most sense, obviously, is to run executive session before the public meeting. Um, rather than another day or a weekend, which is another day, but obviously we're pretty busy. So that's the most common one, that common sense one. Um, in that case, the start time can be decided by the chairs ahead of time, the agenda set up by the chairs, uh, based on factors such as the expected length or who the participant's going to be, their availability. Perhaps you know, using that, um, they can choose to schedule all meetings to start at 6 or 6.15 or 6.30, what have you. Um, but we do need to keep in mind, these are some, some of the things that Lisa shared at least, um, keep in mind that we, we still need to meet in public session first in order to vote to go into executive session. So therefore the public would need to be made aware of this for sure um, and certainly at a minimum they would have that um, at their disposal with the agenda. Um, another situation which might occur is that we have executive session at 6 or whenever we start it and it runs past 7.15 when we're scheduled to start or even 6.45 if that was happened to be a date that we had the student one. Um, so our options at that point would be, um, well, we can keep the public waiting. Hopefully, I, I don't think there would be much support for that. But if that were to occur, we could end executive session. We can hold public session and then we can reconvene public session when the public, when the executive session, when the public session ended. Um, that said, um, I do think that maybe having an end time to the executive session might help us be, be more consci conscious of time. So that might handle itself. Um, one rare possibility that might come up, I think, would be that if someone shows up for public comment at let's say, at the, exe at the executive session. So let's say we schedule it at 6. Somebody sees an agenda, doesn't read it thoroughly, and shows up at 6. Um, and I asked Lisa if that ever happened. She said no, but she said, you know, what you could do in that case is you can acknowledge them if you want for uh, community, uh, community forum A and then run another one later, or you can ask the person to return. It, these are just ways that we probably could work around it. Um, so for tonight, I really just wanted to get a, a feel for how everybody felt and if there were some consensus for having executive sessions scheduled at other times, whenever possible, I would just ask that um, the persons creating, responsible for creating the uh, agenda consider all start times. I'm not advocating that we have a schedule. Maybe we should ahead of time. I'm not advocating that all of them begin earlier. I'm just asking or promoting the idea that um, Further thought has gone into scheduling it above and beyond the standard that we're now doing afterward. And maybe if there's a, some interest, that could be a quick doodle poll to find out people's availability and whatnot. Um, but that really depends on what other people think. If everybody says this is working great, then uh, we've just wasted uh, just five minutes. <laughs> but if other people feel it's a good idea, I thought it would be a good thing for us okay. as a committee to discuss. So that's why I asked for it. All right, so I'll now entertain comments. And Mr. Meyer, I'll start with you. 
Um, so I have not been on the school committee nearly as long as Lisa Menick, so I, but in my time in the school committee, we have done all three things. We've had executive sessions that started before. We've had executive sessions that started before, were adjourned until the end of the meeting, and we've also done it at the end. I think that one of the issues that came up in having it before was we didn't want to keep the public waiting, so it, that would constrain discussion. I thought, you know, I think there was some sense that we need to wind this up. Um, and then adjourning felt awkward because you'd be in the middle of the discussion, you'd break for three hours and you'd come back and then you'd, the executive session, you wouldn't have gained any benefit from having the previous executive session because people would come back and rehash everything <laughs> they'd said. Um, and that, that just, it didn't add to the efficiency. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with you that the bleary-eyedness of, of discussing things until one o'clock um, is suboptimal, but at the same time, that's one of the few times when if people have views and they disagree, they don't feel like, you know, they feel like they're going to argue it, they're going to stick by their guns because they don't feel constrained by an end time. So, um, so I, and I, I think that being, being flexible, if it was a short executive session, if we did it before, then that would, I think that would make some sense. Depending on the item. But again, that's the other thing is that we, I think when we did this, we said, oh, well, we'll do it only when we have short executive sessions. And then they kept school committee members being school committee members. They were <coughs> short, so. <laughs> um, anyone else wish to comment? Ms. Fallon. I was just going to say, I, I, do, I do like the idea of being flexible because there are executive sessions where we know that you're just informing us something quickly, taking the sense <coughs> of the committee or updating us that are very different from some of our other sessions that we expect to take hours and we're excited if they only take an hour and a half. Um, and so I, I do think that that really, I would, I would rather be flexible in whatever decision we make than say we always do something some way because I don't mind having it at the end of a regularly scheduled meeting if it's just you know a quick thing but for some of these longer discussions or if we were looking at our agenda saying oh this agenda is probably going to take forever uh, maybe we should schedule it for a you know a separate night or whatever so i i do i do like the idea of flexibility Ms. Hennessy. <clears throat> i agree with what you said the only other thing i would add would be perhaps in setting the agenda if we know it's going to be a longer executive session to be mindful of put it, what's put on the agenda. Um, that would be the only thing. I think if we're gonna be flexible to be thoughtful, with that, I think you're thoughtful too, um, but sometimes at 12.30, I'm bleary eyed. Yeah. So. Mr. Moore? Yeah, I was just curious, to, I would ask uh, our vice chairman, because I think you were, you were the vice chairman when we had some fairly commonly executive sessions before the regularly scheduled meeting and then we haven't for a long time you you recall what i do i mean changed? my recollection was that um you know even the set even the 715 time for starting our monthly meetings was at times for the committee challenging so the uncertainty of when we would have an executive session and at what time that would start and then, of course, trying to get the entire body here so that we could have a quorum vote and go into executive session became challenging. Uh, the optimum solution, I believe, at the time was that we were getting a quorum showing up for 715, which allowed us to do our school committee business and then do executive session because we had enough people. Um, so I think there was some strain on our clerk to make sure that there was going to be a sufficient amount of membership showing up early enough for the executive session. And at times it was, you know, troublesome to make sure that we had a quorum to be at the executive session where we would hope that our entire body would be there to um, participate in the conversation. So it seemed like at times it was exclusive to just those that could arrive because they had a little bit more flexibility in their schedule or they, uh, you know, they could get out of work or get coverage for the kids or whatever it is to make that earlier meeting, whereas others were unable to. Now, at 11 o'clock, 
after sitting around the table for many hours, we're all here, it's easier to move into an executive session. And if you're arriving late, you got here and you're able to participate anyway. So that's kind of how I remember it. How it sort of faded from one to the other. Because yeah. it seemed like it was pretty common. And then, and I agree, I, I remember all those issues. And then all of a sudden, nobody was scheduling them anymore. And I didn't know <laughs> if it was a conscious decision or if it just sort of, you know. I think in the end, in order to make sure that we were able to take care of that business portion, um, when we saw that we had the amount of folks we needed at the end of the meeting, we started just keeping them scheduled at the end. Ms. Foss. Um, just two comments. One, I think we, I would agree that it's nice to not get home so late at night, um, and it sounds like we all agree on that. One potential issue with changing to before the meeting is if you schedule the executive session at 6, and the regular meeting wasn't until 7.15, you could also get in a situation where executive session finished and we're kind of sitting around and we're all busy and we, we aren't actually meeting during that time. So I'll just put that out as something that would be good to avoid if possible. Um, and related to this and just what time the meetings end, I, I think I already heard some of this said, but I think being more aware of what's on the agenda and just trying to when there is expected to be a long executive session, maybe as we did last time, hold off some topic that's less pressing. But to have this in mind, and I don't know if it's appropriate to say a time, but I think a goal of getting done by 10 would be terrific. And people can argue and say it should be earlier or later. I don't care, I'm just putting out a time. But um, guessing how long <coughs> things are gonna take and not having it go in through all hours of the night. And along those lines, maybe consider when we invite guests to speak giving them a suggestion that a really good presentation should be able to happen in 10 to 12 minutes or something. I think there are places we can make the meeting shorter at times, and the discussion's important, but um, there are places that potentially could be cut. Ms. <coughs> Fallon? I was, I was just going to say that when when you guys used to have executive session before meetings, you weren't meeting with the Student Advisory Council. Right. Either. And so I feel like if you were already struggling, to meet beforehand, that that if we were trying to add executive stuff in before the student advisory committee meetings, like that would be tough to get here at like six o'clock. I think that's all. Other comments? Yes, Mr. You know, I realize all the um, uh, you know difficulties in sort of figuring it out, but I do think we really leave ourselves at a disadvantage by <coughs> having executive session after these meetings. I think sitting around, you know, having executive session and it's 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, and we're all exhausted. I just feel like that's really, um, you know, we're not at our best, and it's a. I, I think we're kind of doing ourselves and the issues sometimes a disservice by trying to kind of, um, you know, force it through. So it'd be great to be, I realize all the complications, I know there's no easy solution, but I like the idea of trying to find a different solution to having executive session after our meetings. And so maybe that's having some flexibility to be able to have executive sessions sometimes beforehand. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I'm glad that you brought up the subject because it's, it is really concerning to me. I'm, you know, exhausted, I know for one. And so I, anyway, I think we would do better having it beforehand or on a different night, which I'm sure none of us want, but um, something of that ilk. So I guess my question as the chair who works with the vice chair and the superintendent would be if, how would it be disruptive to people or how much notice would you need to like, if, if, um, no, Generally, we plan on either 7:15 or 6:45, depending on which meeting it is. But if, how quickly could people adapt if we said we're going to meet at 5:30 tonight? You know, with that or six? I mean, is that is there like a threshold for people that like I can't, I just can't be here earlier than six, or I can't be here? I'm just trying to get a sense of it. Because the executive sessions, do they do they come to the um, they come to us later? Like, you, we, we couldn't plan ahead. Does that happen? Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes, sometimes yeah, it's a development in collective right. bargaining. Sometimes yeah. it's a development in a lawsuit. And so we, don't know have, until we don't meeting. often know. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes it's right up to the day that we have to post the meeting that we say we need to add an executive session. Right. So sometimes there's not as much planning for that. Right. So um, 
So that's just a challenge that if yeah. we, mm -hmm. if we, you know, if the like the notice we have tonight, which is about you know litigation, if somehow there was a breaking issue that we needed an executive session, um, if I were to, you know, on the Tuesday that we post the meeting, say we're going to meet, we're going to try to meet at 5:30 because we want to have you know enough time or six because we want to have enough time to discuss this. Would how quickly could you adapt to that? That's just my, you know, so we don't end up in the situation where. You know, right. we're waiting and there's not a quorum showing up for the meeting and then mm -hmm. we're then we've totally, you know, right. uh, shot ourselves yeah. in the foot. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think in those cases sending out a quick doodle poll and asking people if they can make a commitment would yeah. be my advice. But otherwise I'm sure we okay. I'm sure whatever we say today might change next month. Yeah. Given our personal agenda. But it's one thing if we're just gonna like approve minutes in an executive set, you know, like we got some minutes we have to approve or something like rudimentary like that, but if it's some so that would just be my yeah. my concern as the as a, trying to schedule it. Laura trying to schedule it. How could we guarantee we get a quorum if we suddenly went from 7:15 to 6 because we had a break? Whereas we know 7:15, everybody knows that that's the start time. So, like you said, you know, you know, you're going to get your quorum for that hopefully. So, okay. Um, yes, Mr. Moore. I don't. I don't think I'm asking this to be acted on, but I. I, I think. I think the issue is not so much executive session as the regular meetings and their, their length, and and I and I think the only way to make those shorter is to schedule them more frequently, and I don't know that that's necessarily what people want to do, but I mean it's pretty true, you know, that during when we schedule two monthly meetings during you know the last couple of months, in general, what that means is that we can we can apportion the agenda so that if and we've done that, where we, where we had a lot of stuff on an agenda, so we moved some of it on to the next meeting, which was just going to be a discussion of the budget, but we put a few other items on because, you know, to sort of even off the load. And as far as, for me, that's, uh, that's actually where the crux of it is. And I don't know that we want to go to, you know, every other week meetings, but um, I think that is the... From my perspective, the solution to the problem of, of long meetings is to have more of them. Um, I was curious. <laughs> I just I know you did uh, the survey of um, executive sessions. I'm just curious, Dr. Provost, in your experience, do most school committees meet on a twice a month or once a month, or what's the normal pattern? Uh, there actually just was a survey done um, on the superintendent's listserv. Once a month was the most dominant model. The next after that was twice a month. I would say there are maybe 50 or so districts that do twice a month. Okay. There was one district that did three times a month. Strangely, it was a district <laughs> of about 600 students. <laughs> I'm not really sure what's going on there. Okay, very intimate. Um, this is sort yes. of just a, a random question, but um, somebody used the doodle poll. Is that, can we do that as a? Yes, we can. That's yeah. legal. It's just a ministerial, right. just trying to schedule a meeting. You can totally do that okay. electronically. Okay. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> yes. Um, I mean, I wonder when the executive sessions did Ms. Minnick talk about when the executive sessions were on a different night at all? I mean, I wonder if there was a night that we held for executive session, not that I'm sure anybody wants to do that either, but a different solution than having meeting twice a month. So only meeting a second time when there's an executive session. But did she? Oh, did, speak she to said that it occurred. I don't recall her okay. saying how it happened. Okay. I, mean, I, I can see it not being popular, but um, no. I mean, you know, I guess in the spirit of what some of us are saying, it sounds like we would all like to be more flexible. We'd all like to end earlier, but there's so many other prevailing factors. I didn't know that it was so hard. I mean, it brings up a really good point. I didn't know it was so hard to bring up. Um, to get people here earlier. Well, that just kind of defeats the whole purpose. I just know, and I agree with you, it's just when I said um, I just want to end earlier, it's because I want to be fully aware over these issues that we all agree are really, really important. So how do you do that other than shortening the regular meeting time or adding another meeting? Um, none of these are good, great solutions, but I think the current way we're doing it doesn't really um, serve many of us too well or the objective that we have in mind. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I, I would still like to just propose that some additional thought go into it. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can try some stuff and see how it works. Maybe we can see another day. I wasn't really 
going to put forward a motion or to have a vote or anything tonight. I just want to really get people's feelings, and it sounds like we we have many different opinions on this, based on both their own personal needs and experience with it so far. So, Ms. Voss. I mean, I don't know if it's helpful, and maybe people need more time to think about it. But I'm sitting here feeling like I completely agree. The shorter meetings, I would be a lot better at, and. Um, I can publicly say that I would be fine with either doing executive session on a different Thursday night in the month or whatever night, or this idea of Mr. Moore's, um, maybe we have a catch up meeting. Maybe it's not two every month, but more like every other month there's a possibility of a meeting which can get canceled if there isn't extra business and just keeping the meeting shorter, just having that option and being able to cancel them as needed. So, I mean, what we can do is, uh, you know, the, the scheduling team can kind of take this under advisement and look at upcoming agendas and try to get a sense of where this might work. And we might surprise you with an email about let's do our, you know, if we want to schedule something at six and try it and try an early executive session, give it a try and yeah. see what happens. Right. It's so, probably the best thing we can do if yeah. we can work it out on such a day that people can make it. <laughs> exactly. Or we don't have student union or, you know, the. Yeah. You know, that's a new variable we didn't have so right well, that's what we have tonight as an example and just this discussion is taking 25 minutes and we have such limited opportunities to have discussions like yes. this so it's all this catch-22 stuff that we're limited to come up with creative solutions yes. because the nature of when we can talk and yet there's pressure not to talk because the meetings are going on so yeah it's a tough dilemma I would just appreciate and it sounds like other people would appreciate maybe trying something when it works for folks just being okay. flexible and that's all I it's Good, good talk. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for, um, thank you for for raising the issue. Yeah. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, uh, had been scheduled to be a vote on the business administrator contract. Um, we don't have a contract. What's that? We, we do have. not have a contract, so um, we will be skipping over that one. Um, so the next item on the agenda is. Uh, Dr. Provost presenting the reports of the Collins Center uh, study results, followed by a requested vote on some revised job descriptions. Thank you. In the spirit of that last discussion, I'm going to try to be extremely economical in my speech. Um, I always feel that when you have documents, the documents can speak for themselves. So I just want to talk about what you don't see in um, the papers that's, that are in your packets. Um, there are a number of employees in our district who are non-represented and I think they're in a unique situation unlike um, employees who are part of a union where there are collective bargaining agreements renegotiated every three years or members who individually negotiate contracts like superintendents and business managers um, those processes um, sort of ensure that you're keeping up with market rates for positions when you have people who are in non-rep positions, they may um, get out of sync with the current market conditions. And so I think it's helpful from time to time to um, do surveys for your non-represented employees. I felt that there was a good opportunity to do that. Um, it was actually last year this project started because I knew that the Collins Center was coming into Northampton to do some salary survey work for city employees. So this would also give us an opportunity to compare not only to comparable positions in other districts, but also to compare to comparable positions um, within the city. So you have the Collins Center report. Um, my my um, intention is to implement it as recommended. Uh, for your knowledge, the estimated impact for this year's budget is about $12,000 for all of the non-represented employees. The impact for next year's budget, and we have that money currently in our budget, the impact for next year's budget would be about $11,700. Um, the other thing that you get when you conduct one of these surveys is the opportunity to update your job descriptions to match what employees are currently doing because jobs morph over time and so um, I would if I can move on to the next thing sure I would um, ask the school committee to approve these new new job descriptions in mass um, they were the 
pr provided by the Collins Center based on their um, individual observations of our employees. They were reviewed by our employees and by me, and I think they all accurately <coughs> represent what the positions currently require. Okay. So, um, uh, any discussion about the report? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the revised job descriptions. Make a motion to approve the revised job descriptions as presented by the superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Seconded by Mr. Meyer. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the revised job descriptions, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that um, matter is approved. Uh, next, we'll move to the uh, report from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, and I'll turn to the Chair, Ms. Fallon. Um, first off, we have a second reading on and a vote on um, the creation of an advanced placement exam um, policy, fee reduction policy. Um, we um, are able to access Title IV funds to help pay for um, the AP exams for uh, our students, but we needed to have a policy on file that expl expressed how um, those funds would be made available. And so this policy um, would state that any student who's eligible for reduced lunch, um, I'm sorry, for free lunch, the exam is free. Uh, any student who's eligible for reduced lunch or uh, whose household income is between 185% and 200% of the poverty guidelines will be charged $15 per AP exam. Um, and then um, we will have to, we did not include um, any other um, guides in this because the poverty guidelines, I guess they change every year, the numbers. And so there, that will be a, not a part of the policy itself, but linked to it. So I will, you're moving to uh, approach throughout this and I will second that motion. I don't know if so is this a uh, I thought this is yes so there's going okay. to be an amendment okay. <laughs> yeah so um so you're so the um so this is the second reading and a vote so you've moved it Miss Fallon and Mr. Moore has seconded okay and, and, I, and I would like to offer the, the amendment. amendment coming <laughs> the amendment is is highlighted in green on your copies is that we will add to the policy that's originally written that information on how to obtain the transcript will be provided to students taking AP courses and then there is a place alternative alternate al alternately is what it said but it's alternatively is what it will be amended to okay so you've made an amendment does miss fallon second seconding it? yes okay. so there's a been an amendment made to the uh, policy um as read by mr moore um it's been made and seconded any questions about the amendment uh, miss fargamini not about the amendment okay so can we wait till we get yes. back to the main motion okay great um, uh, okay, all those in favor of adopting the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Now we're back to the main motion. Ms. Fragamini, do you have a question? Um, so I realize that the, the draft advanced placement a exam subsidy information is not being voted on, but I believe this was sent out. And um, I am just wondering, and I think this is something that the Rules and Policy Committee, I assume this is something you kind of worked on in association with the the change in the policy we have not discussed that that in in subcommittee yet okay is it will it be discussed in subcommittee the the information sheet i'm assuming so but would i be able to set the agenda for our next meeting yet do you have sure. yes i'm just wondering because there's a there's a sentence in here that says the third sentence students enrolled in ap courses are encouraged to actively participate in the corresponding ap exams and i am um just wondering about that sentence and how it reflects the actual AP testing policy and would just encourage when a discussion about that draft is proposed that that language be looked at but if I'm totally off track with the schedule of things I my apologies I think that that language might be anticipating a change in the policy <coughs> but that's yet to be decided as you know <laughs> yes okay any other questions about the policy as amended Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of this uh, vote, um, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, so the motion uh, is adopted. Uh, next, uh, continue, Ms. Fallon. 
Um, and this um, next item is also a second reading that we will be voting on. It's um, updating file JQ, student fees and fines. Um, the general idea is that um, that while no student will be denied access uh, due to an inability to pay fees, all students will be required to remit fines. And it talked about um, the notification so that uh, in the second and last paragraph that this was the part that we are changing um, upon the recommendation of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees um, was that all student fees, both optional and required, will be listed and described annually in each school's student handbook or in some other written form and distributed to each student. The notice will advise students that fees are to be paid and of the penalties for failure to pay them. So it was, that was the important part of the policy change was to make sure that we are in fact posting all of the fees that we charge and um, notifying families of both um, what the fees are and what the penalty is for not paying them. So is that a motion? Yes, so I would move to um, approve file uh, policy JQ as amended. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion about policy JQ, Ms. Pizansky? So I'm just a little confused in rereading it today about the first paragraph. So it says that um, some students may not be able to pay these fees while no student will be denied access due to an inability to pay fees. All students will be required to remit fines. But aren't there some qualifiers to that? Aren't we sort of saying that, um, or are we saying? Well, so if a parent, I mean, we could use nature's classroom or AP testing, recognizing that that might change just as an example. Um, but, you know, uh, if, if a parent said, you know, we can't afford to pay, but we're not free or reduced lunch, they wouldn't have to pay, or how would it? Well, so, yeah, so it was the, the students who are eligible for the free lunch program are exempt from paying fees. Right. And then that students who are eligible for reduced lunch will pay a reduced fee. Um, and I think we have mechanisms in place in many areas where if a student's un in a, unable to pay the fee, right. that there is some sort of fee right. available. But it just feels like the opening <coughs> paragraph, and maybe I should have, uh, no, I is missing some kind of qualifier. Because it's saying that uh, this is true for all students or all families. But what we're, we're really trying to say is it's true for re free and reduced lunch program families, that they would not be denied access due to an inability to pay. Right, again, I, just because I know, I guess AP testing's top of mind, but if a family says we can't afford the AP testing. Dr. I, I don't know. I, mean, I agree, I think we're I agree on the same saying. page of what the intent of this policy is. I just okay. want to be sure we're kind of clear in that opening paragraph. Okay. I, I, I should be I, off I, base. There, there was a right. prepositional phrase that is struck there also, which I think um, is connected to my understanding of this policy, which is the, the concept of access used to, or in the prior policy set into any program. I think the reason that that was struck was to to clarify that the access we're talking to here is access to the the education. So in other words, we're not going to say to a child, you may not enter the building, you owe $250. You know, but right. there may be parts of the program that the child can't access because they, they can't pay the fee associated with the program. So for example, athletics or whatever. Um, you may have students who are just not able to participate in athletics because they don't qualify for a waiver and they can't pay the fee. But they're not denied access to an education mm -hmm. because of their inability to pay. Likewise, if they have an outstanding lunch debt, they're not denied access to an education because of their bad lunch debt. Mm -hmm. So that's, as a person who's implementing the policy, that's right. how I understand right. it. No, I understand right. that. I think I'm on the same, I, I agree with the intent of the policy. I just. Well, then do we need to have an amendment to that to say what we're not denying access to? More specifically? Denied access to an education? <laughs> Public education? Ms. Fragamini? Um, I'm, I just want to, again, include this, this question of AP exam requirement into what Superintendent's Provost just said about how it's about denying access to education for in the example of an AP fee, which Ms. Bizancy brought up, that very much is access to an education. So 
if a student said, I cannot pay this based on this policy, and if we included that piece accessing a public education, what if a student says they can't pay an AP exam fee? That's a class. So I guess what I would, what I would say to that in terms of this language is I don't think that that language would prevent that scenario from taking place because there are comparable courses that a child could take in order to satisfy <coughs> graduation requirements of the high school. Ms. Voss? Um, I, I'm on it back to a different topic. Um, d d if you were responding to that, I can wait. I don't, okay. okay. Um, I, I, when I read it last time, I didn't realize this, but what Ms. Busansky is saying, um, I think we need to be more clear just so it's not misunderstood. I agree we all kind of know what it's saying, but I don't think I have quite the right words, but where it says while no student will be denied access, I think what we're trying to say is while no student from a low income or a family with reduced um, lunch or free lunch will not be denied, denied access, is that what we're saying? No. What are, while no student will be denied access due to an, an inability to pay, I think we're not defining what we mean by an inability to pay. So in the words I'm suggesting, I'm trying to define what we mean by inability to pay. That's what I thought we meant. There's two, yeah, there's two things that aren't clear there. There's one is, what do we mean by an inability to pay? And there's access to what? That, that's right. So there's two separate things. You're right. And they're both not clear. So. So is there um, someone going to recommend an amendment to remedy this? Just the free and appropriate public education is usually understood to not, as Dr. Provost has said, you don't have to provide the same thing to everybody, but there are essential elements of an education that a court, if you don't provide them, will say you're not providing that. And I think that that's addressing your concern, which is it's not, it's not element by element. Right. So that if a student can't access a particular element of the program, that's not a denial of a free and appropriate public education. It's something that's more, that's essential, and that without it, they can't achieve either what DESE expects from you know, students. If we didn't provide, for instance, biology instruction or any science instruction, then they couldn't pass a, a science MCAS. And so that would be, I think, inappropriate. So I think we do need something like free and appropriate public education, or the essential elements of a public education. I mean, something that would spell out that, yes, we're not saying that a denial of any, like den denying you the ability, and again, denial, the issue of denial is, is um, difficulty doesn't equal denial, right? Mm -hmm. Hardship doesn't equal denial. Denial means under no circumstances. So I think that's the line. Would you like to suggest uh, an amendment? Um, I wanted, I would do more research before I, because again, if I don't want to, just free and appropriate is often used in the special ed context, so I would want to get. Can we, what's, what's the motion to postpone table? Can we just take to a certain. We've actually, I think, I think we as a yeah. subcommittee tabled this once because we're struggling with some of the same issues, and I think that. <clears throat> There is, there's definitely a need to change the portion, of, you know, the portions of this policy um, because we need to post it. But I, I understand that it's difficult to make, to be clear without mis leading to misinterpretations or just not being clear enough. And I think maybe it would benefit us all to think about it a little bit more because this is not a policy that's rushed. So I'd like to make a motion, motion to table. Yeah, it was just really postpone. a motion to postpone consideration. Yes. Until the next so I'm counting on all of you to fix this by the next meeting. <laughs> just kidding. Start your research, Mr. Martin. <laughs> um, so all those in favor of postponing reconsideration to the next meeting, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that will come back, hopefully, um, at your next meeting. No. So now the next item on the agenda is the report. You know. um, <laughs> this is from Ms. Buzanski, and this is from the Mass Association of School Committee Day on the Hill 2018. 
So on April 25th, uh, Ms. Fallon, Mr. Kaufman, and myself attended the mask um, day on the Hill, and if I was giving this report on April 26th, it'd be very different, but, um, but I'm not. I'm giving it in May, and we no longer have any representation at the State House, and uh, we did have a good conversation with then Senator Rosenberg um, about a lot of issues that, you know, we were there to advocate on, sort of funding um, the increasing number of high needs students that we're seeing in our school, charter school uh, reimbursement, et cetera, but um, obviously the things have changed rather rapidly. It was a very, I thought there was a really good showing of school committee members, which was really nice to see. I really felt like it was almost double the number who had been there the year before, and that was great. So it was great that everyone was sort of fanned out in the state house. Uh, they had a good morning of speakers. Um, Noah Berger from the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center, Representative Aaron Vega from Holyoke, Senator D. Domenico talked about the Kids First initiative. I thought all of that was really good. Um, but what's really more interesting is I think what's happening now, which is um, Circuit Breaker has uh, been increased to 12 and a half million. It's been, uh, and has been approved by the House and the Senate. And if all things work out okay, I know they're haggling over a few last issues. This will go to the governor's desk and hopefully be signed. And that would be great. That represents, I guess, a I don't know, 72, 75 percent um, fully funding of it, so, um, uh, or increase. Supplemental in FY18. Yes. So, yes. It would bring it up to 75 percent. Seven, it would bring it up to 75 percent. definition of full funding. That's more, exactly. that's, well, that's more than exactly. full funding, yeah, actually. It's more than what we got, okay? Um, <laughs> and then uh, today, Senator Chang Diaz's uh, bill to implement the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Um, passed unanimously in the Senate. It's going to go to the House. I heard from Ms. Fallon tonight that Representative Seibach is going to be supporting it. I think a lot of our legislators will be, so that would be, um, that would also be a good thing and would set us up well, hopefully, for the fair share amendment to pass. Um, so those are some, you know, small kind of rays of hope, but uh, it's definitely a challenging time, I think, for our district right now for the next nine months. So we'll, um, without any representation. So next year's uh, Day on the Hill will look very <laughs> different for us. Thanks. Thank you so much for that report and thanks for thanks so much for being there to, to represent. Um, the next item on the agenda, this is um, a vote. Uh, this is Mr. Kaufman's request to refer the matter of AP <coughs> credit to the curriculum subcommittee. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. So um, you all remember um, well, maybe you don't, but uh, two or three, maybe two meetings ago, we had discussed uh, the, the issue of AP test taking to do two different subcommittees, policy and curriculum. But the, depending on the outcome of, the, of our full committee's decision on this policy um, is also an embedded question about whether the student transcript should, dis should distinguish between students who take the tests and those who don't. If you remember, this was part of the student presentation. I think a lot of the public or other types of forums um, taking place is if this if this policy changes and students are able to not don't or are not required to take the test um, then what would they get on their transcript and there's some schools that give AP credit there's some that give honors credit there's maybe some that give no credit I'm not really sure but the initial piece about um, whether the exam itself should be required was an ex was part of our charge but it was not the other piece about credit itself was not an explicit part of what we were asked to do. So um, the cost the subcommittee is gathering on 31st, we are inviting a lot of people. We are opening it up to the public and we have some assurances from Dr. Provost. I mean, because the subcommittee just met right before this meeting, we didn't have much of a chance to discuss the process, but we certainly have some reassurances that we could call upon people um, who have something to offer. We see that, well, I can't speak on behalf of my colleagues. I see that as one of our charges is to um, get useful feedback uh, from, a, uh, from a number of people and come back with that information, feedback, and opinions to share with everybody to take the vote. And it seems like um, having that opportunity to not only just focus on the exam requirement, but also what the transcript options would be as a result would be beneficial for us to come back with you with that information as well. So I wanted to make a motion because it wasn't clear to from the last meeting, that was not part of it, that 
um, the full committee would designate to the curriculum subcommittee um, in addition to the AP exam requirement also the question of AP credit for students who do not take the exam if in fact that policy were to be available so there's been a motion made is there a second. seconded by Miss Hennessy did you have a comment I have a question comment you keep I, in my head it's a policy the transcript and you even said policy so I'm wondering why it's either not why it's not with the rules and policy for that part of it or what, <coughs> what you're thinking is about the curriculum yeah I mean I think that we that was part of the discussion I don't think it ended up on either my, I could be wrong I'm not sure it ended up on either subcommittee's agenda and therefore it felt like it was missing okay. um, and because we're, we'll be hopefully talking to folks from the high school, parents, students, guidance, achievers, et cetera, it just seemed like a good opportunity. It's hard for me to separate the two because of that, it would, be, it would be weird if, in fact, we changed the policy and now students said, okay, now what, now what happens? That would be a big part of their decision, I would think. Mm -hmm. So that's where I came into. I'm not saying it's okay. not a policy thing as well, but I don't think it ended up being, being um, you know, it wasn't allocated to either group to look at, and it seemed a big piece of the picture. Ms. Farmini. Yeah, just to kind of second what Mr. Kaufman said, um, I think that for many students and also teachers, um, that question of credit is very central to developing their opinions on what the policy for optional or not optional should be, and I think it's very centrally related to how many students would choose to not take the test, or what that would look like, or who's not taking the test. So I think that there two issues that are very closely related in the larger opinion of whether or not um, AP testing should be optional or not. Okay, Ms. Fallon. I just, I actually have a technical question. So is the reason that we're even having a vote on what appears on the subcommittee's agenda because there's a question of whether that matter should be referred to curriculum or rules and policy or is the reason we're having a vote because they wouldn't take up an issue without the approval of the full committee, which I think seems it was, I, I, my sense is it was felt that the AP matter, the testing matter, the op, whether it had already been referred to them, and they were just concerned that this was a piece of that was sort of left out there that needed that they felt that they wanted to take up as well. So I think um, I guess okay, I guess that because you guys don't refer vote to refer policies to mm -hmm. us to address mm -hmm. in subcommittee yeah. it just seemed strange that because we were voting on this yeah. but i think because we had so many presentations at the full school committee to us about this issue that it felt like it needed to be referred to a subcommittee to study it but dr provost so i just want to share some of the conversation from the the school committee meeting that was two committee meetings prior to the, the this one held tonight um which had to do with the the core mission of the curriculum subcommittee, which is, of all of our committees, um, I think the most ambiguous. Education reform has taken um, the, most of the curriculum decisions in the district and placed them in the hands of the certified staff who are able to, um, we believe, have the expertise to, to guide those decisions. Um, so uh, the policy around the curriculum subcommittee um, actually mentions other matters that may be referred by the committee from time to time because this is a committee that I, I refer to I mean this isn't your policy but it feels this way to me is almost like a standing ad hoc subcommittee that you know receives issues from the full committee and different from policy which you know has a clear mandate to continue to update the policies which change on a yearly basis or the budget and property subcommittee that has a clear mandate to continue to develop the budget on an annual basis um, the curriculum committee sort of floats out there okay so there's been a motion made and seconded to refer this matter to the curriculum committee any further discussion all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. Opposed? any abstentions okay so that matter is uh, duly referred uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, we'll, we've already uh, taken care of uh, uh, Miss Bates's greenhouse so we'll move on to a vote to accept a gift this is fitness together and it's fifteen hundred dollars towards student lunch debt Yes, in, in light of the repeated discussion I think the committee has had and the publicity that's out there about the amount of student lunch debt that the program is carrying, 
um, Jessica Fainoff of Fitness Together came forward to the superintendent's office and offered to make a donation of $1,500 to be applied to the debt in the program. So we worked out the details on how we're going to make, make that and allocate it to students to make sure that it technically reduces the debt. Um, so we would ask the school committee to go ahead and accept this donation very graciously. Make a motion to accept the gift from Fitness Together in the amount of $1,500 towards student lunch debt. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Fallon. Any discussion about this? Do we, do we know how that's getting applied? I know in the past it was given kind of to principals to look at individual students or yeah what we've done is we actually put together um, I, I attended a statewide meeting where this issue was on an agenda and there were several school districts that had a method they were using that I brought back and worked through with the food service director then we've run it by the administrators basically it's a four-tier system um, the first priority the only way you truly reduce the debt is by applying it to students just putting it into the account doesn't do anything for the debt. So we've been trying to figure out how to get it to kids. So the first tier would be looking at any student who's now eligible for free or reduced price lunches that had debt prior to their approval. Because the assumption would be if they were headed towards qualifying for free and reduced, they probably were struggling economically then. So we would look at the amount of debt that that group of kids represents and proportionately apply any donations there. If donations exceed that amount, we would then go to kids that are on reduced price lunch and look at any debt they had before they became eligible for reduced price lunch. If the donations keep rolling in, the third tier would be to look at kids who are currently on reduced lunch who struggled to come up with the 40 cents a day for the reduced lunch. And if there's anything left, we would actually hold that in abeyance and rerun that calculation 60 days later, 30 days later to see if we picked up any other kids. So I think we have a method that we actually borrowed from a couple school districts on the other end of the state that we think is going to work. So, there's a, been a motion made and seconded by Ms. Fallon. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And obviously we thank Fitness Together for making this donation. Um, next items on the agenda are the Business Administrator's Report followed by the Personnel Report, both from uh, Ms. Walzik. Yeah, a couple of highlights on the financial reports. Um, you've got your standard reports there and some highlights to that. Overall, the budget is looking more positive in light of a couple of things that have happened that we outlined here. A big piece of that has been the solar program that the city implemented, and the way that that's worked out there actually has been a savings to our budget, which we also talked about going into next year's budget. So that's actually helping cover a number of our deficits. Um, we've had a fair amount of leave of absences and some staff turnover this year that does help. And then we've got some transportation savings are knock on wood with only about a month of school to go. Um, our homeless transportation costs are down and all the fuel is beginning to go back up. We had substantial fuel savings for the first part of the year. So those things are able to offset what we had projected as some of the deficits earlier in the year. So that's that's been helpful. Um, Moving on, the governor released the first portion of money to school dis districts to assist with the cost they incurred by providing services to students displaced from Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, our first installment came in and is listed here as just under $12,000. Um, it's only a portion of what we've expended, but something is better than nothing. And there will be a presumably smaller portion appropriated also to us from the state before June 30th this fiscal year. And as I've outlined here, we are actually able to carry that money into next year if we choose and use it for services next year. Um, gifts in accordance with your policy. There were two gifts this month accepted by the superintendent. One was from Robert Kuzmensky of Northampton, um, a donation in honor of Brad McGrath, so that would be added to the donations that have come in to us for the um, athletic program. And then also a donation of $999 from Carlene and Joseph McCarthy, which was to help pay for a bus to take the baseball team to Cooperstown. That's happening later in May. Gifts accepted by the, PT, by the principals from the PTOs. We have a number of them this month. There were five at Bridge Street School. Um, a Xerox color printer, playground toys, Kibo kits for coding, um, a bus to JFK for transition programs and a fourth grade trip to the um, Wisteria Hearst Museum, if I'm saying that right, which wow. have a value of probably about $1,500 in total for those. There were five donations accepted at Jackson Street. Three were for field trips. Actually, it looks like all are for field trips. Um, to the Bassett Planetarium, 
Wisteria Hearst Museum. I'm not going to get it right the second time. <laughs> Historic Deerfield, uh, Skinner State Park, and the Holyoke Children's Museum, and those also are in excess of $1,000. And then there were two gifts at JFK. There was a donation to the Scrabble Club for $200 for materials, and also $250 to the um, Grade 7 Green team, I guess it is, um, stipend payments for volunteers to work with that program. And you've got the warrants that have been signed by your school committee reps since your last meeting. Okay. Um, personnel report? Yes, also short in April. There were three new hires that are listed as well as a long-term sub, one separation, and then four people who transferred to different positions within our school district. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Now we turn to our superintendent's report, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. Let me begin my report by following up on Ms. Fallon's request to keep the committee <coughs> in the loop in my work with the PACE Lab program. As a reminder, PACE is an acronym for Programming the Acceleration of Computing and Equity. On April 13th, Molly McLaughlin, John Cristatelli, Kathy Keogh, and I attended the first PACE session. The purpose of that meeting was to compare computer science offerings at middle and high school across the uh, initial cohort of lighthouse districts. I'm happy to say that Northampton's offerings are very comparable to those of the other schools in the cohort. It was a great time for us to share innovations and compare programs with each other. Um, one program that I really latched on to was um, a program offered at a high school in another one of the lighthouse districts where students design, build, program, and fly their own drones. Um, that's a course that I would have camped out in front of the guidance <laughs> suite in order to get into. Um, so I hope we can figure out how to bring something like that to our district. We were also, also officially informed that our IT innovation pathway has been approved by the Department of Education, and we've already exceeded our enrollment goal for the first year of the program. And we're continuing to meet with students and families who are interested in pursuing this guided academic pathway that will allow students to graduate with a high school diploma, transferable college credit, and industry recognized credentials. I think this is something that's really going to change students' lives. Um, we're already hearing about students who are on their way to emotionally checking out of school who can't wait to start in the fall. Um, you know, those of you who work in high schools know that. One of the constant refrains you hear from students is, why are we doing this? What's the relevance? What's the point of it at all? Um, I think this is a pathway that really shows kids a clear connection between what's happening in the class and skills that can be useful for them in life. Um, Molly McLaughlin, Antonio Pagan, and I have also attended some meetings with schools who've obtained uh, the IT or the innovation pathway designation. They're not on, all in IT. Some districts are doing other fields. Um, but through these meetings, we've generated ideas about possible ways to expand this general approach to secondary education, as well as some other um, areas we may want to go into. I've also um, become interested in learning more about the Nashville public schools, because I've learned that a lot of the other districts have um, modeled their pathways on programs from Nashville, which is seen as a leader in this area. So I'm interested in learning more about that. We also held our annual Children's Festival. We had 220 children from at least 156 families and 25 communities. We also celebrated our Excellence in Teaching Award recipients. <coughs> This year's winners one last time were Kim Giroux from Jackson Street School, Hannah Christick from Leeds, Caitlin Schofield from JFK Middle School, and Melly, Melanie Samalevitz from the high school. I sat at Melanie's table, and she told me that apart from the four years when she had to leave to go to college, she's been a part of NHS since she entered as a ninth grade student. <laughs> um, Finally, we made many improvements to our physical plants this month. We enhanced our automated logic energy management system at the high school so that we can now draw cool air into the building overnight. Think of it as a gigantic coal house fan. Um, 
So our hope is that this will reduce our demand on our air chiller system, which is quite costly to run. Um, so we'll be able to keep the school more comfortable in a greener way and save money at the same time. As Candy just said, um, the utility savings is one of the things that's allowing us to um, meet our budget expectations this year. We also replaced roof-mounted AC units at Bridge Street and Leeds as part of the roof repair projects. And we've also started installation of many split heat pumps and energy recovery units in the Jackson Street cafeteria. This will be the first time since I've been in the district that we have had any kind of climate control in the cafeteria at Jackson Street. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are two ancient um, systems that were heating that area. One of them died and the other one was cannibalized to keep one running and then finally when there were no more parts to swap from one unit to the other, um, it just became heated by ovens and opening the door and, and cooled by um, opening windows. So now we have that space on, on track for being climate controlled. Um, so I'm very happy that that, that problem is resolved. Um, also, we're entering the design phase of an upgrade to the HVAC system at JFK Middle School, which will allow us to take advantage of all the updates and improvements in technology over the last time the HVAC system was updated here. So um, many things that have been in planning for a long time just seem to have come into bloom in the month of April. I think it's appropriate. Um, it was a very busy month and a very rewarding month for me as superintendent. Thank you very much, Dr. Provost. Um, we have no business scheduled on the agenda. Uh, future business and meeting dates, we have the Rules and Policy Subcommittee of May 23rd, uh, 1230 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. The Curriculum Subcommittee meeting on May 31st at 2.30 p.m. in the City Hall Hearing Room. And the School Committee meeting of June 14th at 7.15 p.m. here in the JFK Community Room. I uh, now have a uh, request for an executive session, and I'll ask the vice uh, chair to make a motion. Make a motion, a request for an executive session in the JFK Principal Conference Room under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation MUP-186456, whereas open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into executive session. Is there a second? Okay. I need to ask the clerk to call the roll uh, to move in to, um, to approve moving into executive session. Yes. 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 Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. Okay, so I do need to advise the public at this time that the school committee will be moving into executive session because to have this uh, discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect uh, uh, and compromise the reasons for going into executive session. I also need to let the public know that we will adjourn um, from executive session. We will adjourn in exec executive session and not come back into open session. Okay, so now we can uh, move to the executive session.